Uh, before we read, let me just set the stage. Uh, as we turn to 1 Samuel chapter 17, here's the situation. Uh, battle lines have been drawn up. Uh, battle between the Israelites and uh, their arch enemy, the Philistines. And uh, if you can just picture in this in your mind, there are two hills with a valley between. On one hill is uh, the camp of the armies of Israel. Uh, there's a valley between, and then on the opposing hill uh, is the camp of the army of the Philistines. And uh, battle lines have been drawn, and uh, the Philistines send out their champion. And uh, that's where we're going to pick up the story in verse 4 of chapter 17. A champion named Goliath, who was from Gath, came out of the Philistine camp. He was over nine feet tall. He had a bronze helmet on his head and wore a coat of scale armor of bronze, weighing 5,000 shekels. On his legs, he wore bronze greaves, and a bronze javelin was slung on his back. His spear shaft was like a weaver's rod, and its iron point weighed 600 shekels. His shield bearer went ahead of him. Uh, let's just pause there for a minute. I can't let these measurements go by without uh, at least talking them over a little bit. Uh, verse, verse 4 talks about Goliath saying he was over nine feet tall. Let's uh, try to gain some perspective about what that means, and uh, maybe, maybe a picture will help. This uh, picture that I'm going to put on the screen, looks like I need a little help again back in the booth. Uh, this picture that I'm going to put on the screen is a picture of Shaq and his girlfriend, Okay. <clears throat> By the way, his girlfriend is a totally normal height. She's 5'3", right? And uh, he's 7 foot 1 inch. And uh, now just to, you see the difference between a totally normal 5 foot 3 person and uh, Shaquille O'Neal, who's 7 foot 1 inch. Now I want you to realize that the difference between her and him is the same difference that we would have if we put Shaq next to Goliath. So the picture, I mean... The picture we'd say is Goliath, and then he would be like how his girlfriend is. Okay, and now, you know, as we're considering this, most of us here are pretty normal-sized people, right? I want you to picture in your mind what that looks like to come against a giant who would, you know, make Shaq look like his girlfriend. Okay, think of that. And um, just so that we don't, we don't let this go by, uh, I also want to talk about some of these other measurements. Uh, first of all, it says in verse 5, he had a bronze helmet on his head and wore a coat of scale armor of bronze weighing 5,000 shekels. And uh, I know most of us here are not familiar with weighing things in shekels, so let me uh, convert that to pounds. His, his bronze coat weighed 125 pounds, which is the Bible's way of saying he wasn't tall and spindly. He was a man's man. Okay, I mean, this guy was ripped out and he's literally wearing clothes that weigh as much as an average person might weigh. As he just, I mean, and his spear. Look at verse seven. <clears throat> it says his spear shaft was like a weaver's rod and its iron point weighed 600 shekels. And just to kind of convert that to pounds, that's about 15 pounds. Um, anybody here go bowling? Anyone like bowling? Uh, so probably the heaviest bowling balls that you get at a bowling alley are somewhere between 15 and 16 pounds, right? So I want you to imagine kind of a big rod, and, and I wish I had one here so I could just try it. I, I wonder if I could even lift it up with one arm. I mean, just think, this guy was carrying that around, and he was throwing it across fields at people to kill them. And um, okay, now that you get a sense of his size, what we read next will make a lot more sense. Goliath stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, why do you come out and line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine? And are you not servants of Saul? Choose a man and have him come down to me. If he's able to fight and kill me, we'll become your subjects. But if I overcome him and kill him, you will become our subjects and serve us. Then the Philistine said, this day I defy the ranks of Israel. Give me a man and let us fight each other. On hearing the Philistines' words, Saul and all the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. Um, especially those last words, they were dismayed and terrified. The, the word dismayed mean, means something like they were broken, just immobilized, if you will, with, with fear. And um, 
I mean, as we read these words, let's just, a couple things. First, um, I've probably taken this as far as I can. Um, you know, behind the scenes, in the craft of sermonizing, one of the things, even when I was in seminary, my professors used to say, is that a good sermon? You gotta build some tension. I mean, the very best you can do when, when you're giving a story out loud is, is create some tension, it get kind of a cliffhanger, people are gonna wonder what happened, you're on the edges of your seats, and I mean, is he gonna win, is he gonna prevail, what's gonna happen? You already know. Like, I know. Like, even if you've never been in church before, this is your first time, you already know there's this boy named David, he's gonna get five smooth stones, and he's gonna slay the giant, and David's gonna win. So, um, okay, I know that I'm not gonna build tension up and surprise you by the ending. Uh, but what I'd like to try to do, I, I'd like to just, not what the story is. You know the facts of the story. What is this story about? And it kind of, I mean, just what is the story about? Uh, I think to run the risk of spiritualizing the story, it's probably worth saying this. I, I really believe that each and every person who walked through these doors today, we each have what I'd call our personal Goliaths. I mean, uh, not many of us are going to walk out these doors and face a nine-foot giant who's carrying around on, a, you know, like a clothes weighing 125 pounds, throwing a bowling ball's worth of spear at us. I mean, that's not, okay. But, but each of us, we have things that dismay and terrify us, immobilize us, cause us to step back, have some amount of fear, discouragement. Um, for some of us who walk through the doors today, your Goliath might be the bills, Right? They come every single month. They keep growing. Uh, you just have no idea how you're ever going to catch up to them. And uh, just this paying the bills, like, it's, it's just never going to happen. Some of us, it, it may be grades that we know we're never going to make. And uh, that's our Goliath. We just, here's this, this challenge in front of us, and, and I can't make the mark. There, there's some of us, if we were, got real honest with each other, if we started talking about our Goliaths, some of us might identify our marriage or some other relationship. And uh, maybe it's got to the point where there's just so many problems. I mean, there's a history that's built up and you just, we've got to the point like, man, I don't know how I'm ever gonna get out of this. I don't know what the fix is. Uh, we're miserable, this is horrible, but I can't see the way forward. And uh, we're just, we're immobilized maybe with fear. For some of us, it might be an addiction, right? Um, we've tried, we've struggled as hard hard as we can. We've promised ourselves we'd stop, but we just, we can't. We find ourselves going back, and this Goliath is just like, got its grip wrapped around us, and as, you know, we want to get out, but, but we just can't. For some of us, our Goliath might be the past that we can't seem to get over. Maybe something's happened in our history. Uh, people have wronged us. We know, we hear people, they say, you've got to forgive, but well, we can't. How do we forgive that? You're just, man, how, how do I do that? For some of us, not, not the past, but it's, as we face the future, we're filled with anxieties and fears, and there's things that are coming up, and we don't know how we're going to handle it, and it seems like things are spinning out of control. And uh, I don't know what your personal Goliath is, but I would guess that every single person who walked through these rooms today, you're dealing with something that is bigger than you are. And um, whatever that something is, it just causes you to just step back, and uh, to a certain extent, we're just, we're immobilized almost. And, and that's where the Israelites are at. And uh, the reason I bring all that up is, um, what is this story about? You already know the ending, right? Uh, this young boy is going to come. He's going to have great faith. He's going to have bold courage. He's going to go out there, and with small stones, he's going to, you know, defy the giant and, and slay him. And um, <clears throat> here's the thing, my fear. Some of you, uh, as you hear this story, you'll say, well, man, I gotta be more like David. I gotta get bolder, I gotta get more courageous, I gotta try harder, I gotta tackle this Goliath in front of me, I gotta go at him, and uh, I gotta win the victory myself. If, uh, I'd suggest to you, if you walk out of these doors today thinking that, then uh, maybe you haven't heard this story right yet. And so, uh, here's what I'd like to do. I'd like to really bear down on verse 11. Uh, let's read it again. Um, Goliath has come out. He's defied the armies of Israel. That word defy means something. He's, he's cursing them. He's challenging them. And uh, now think about the weight that's on somebody. Like, here, here's the deal. One of, you, one of you come out and face me. If I win, all of you will be slaves. If you win, 
all of us will be your slaves. Think about the challenge that has been presented and the weight that would be on someone's shoulders. It's hand-to-hand combat with this guy. And if I lose, all of my, all of my fellow soldiers, they all serve the Philistines as slaves. And everyone's held back. This is what verse 11 says. On hearing the Philistines' words, Saul and all the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. First, first thing I want to point your attention to, Saul, uh, King Saul, was dismayed and terrified. When you hear that, that name, King Saul, uh, here's what probably ought to pop into your mind. This was sort of humanity's best response to a Goliath. And uh, let's just let's talk about his backstory a little bit. Um, <clears throat> and by the way, as we talk about his backstory, I, I got to just get into uh, a couple of, well, let me put, they're gruesome stories. And um, they come out of the book of Judges, chapters 19 and 20. By the way, um, if uh, you're just reading the Bible for the first time, probably one of the things that's happening to you is if you had this illusion that the Bible was a bunch of sort of idealistic platitudes, holy platitudes, uh, that illusion is being shattered as you realize like there's nothing whitewashed in the Bible at all. It is as real life as it gets. Uh, here's the backstory. And um, uh, before, we, before we get to this verse, um, let me just kind of dive into it this way. Um, there was this man. He was, uh, he was a guy, he, he had a concubine. And I don't know how best to describe that relationship. Like what is the relationship between a man and his concubine? He had this woman that was his concubine. And at some point, she decided he was no good, nobody going nowhere, and decided to leave him. And you can read about this in chapter 9 of the book of Judges. Um, she took off and went back home to her dad's home, which was in the town of Bethlehem at the time. And uh, here's how it went down. After she left, he started to feel a lot of regret and wanted her back and decided that he was going to chase after her and uh, try and win her back. So she go, he goes to the father-in-law's home and um, <clears throat> tries to woo her back. And he's there for a number of days. And finally, she decides, okay, I'll go back with you. And after some number of days, they decide to leave together. And uh, they go to travel away. And uh, you have to understand this, that Israel at the time was broken up into various different tribal groups. And each tribe had their own territory. And it so happened after they left Bethlehem, they went through the tribal territory of the tribe of Benjamin, which was one of the Israelite tribes. And they went to a particular city. The city was known as Gibeah. And uh, they ended up, it was late at night, so they decided to stay the night there, and they entered into this man's home. And um, basically what happened, and, and um, you know, it, it's a real-life kind of gruesome story. It, it's kind of a, a second telling of the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. In the middle of the night, uh, all the townspeople heard that there were strangers there, and they came pounding on the door. And they basically called for the man to uh, give them his concubine so they could have their way with her all night long. And uh, they pounded at the door, and he tried to refuse. But over time, they, there's, I mean, they were overwhelming the, the house. And so finally, he just, in order to save his own life, sent her outside. And these men just, I mean, all night long, when he got up the next morning, she was dead in the street. And, um, I mean, it gets more gruesome. I'm sorry about that, but it's just what the Bible, I mean, it's in the Bible, real life, okay? Uh, he is so upset, so distraught, that this kind of thing not only could happen to him, but could happen in the nation of God's people. It's like he cried, is this okay with everybody? That our nation, God's people, has become like Sodom and Gomorrah? And uh, here's what he did. He, he actually cut up her body into pieces. And he sent a body piece to each of the other tribes of Israel along with this message. Is this all right with you? Or are you going to do something about this? And uh, what ended up happening, this is how the book of Judges actually comes to a conclusion, is civil war broke out. All the other 11 tribes sent troops to come and face the Benjamites. They required, they asked the Benjamites to give up the perpetrators. The Benjamites circled around their brothers and refused. War broke out between all of Israel and the tribe of Benjamin. And um, actually what ended up happening is the tribe of Benjamin almost got completely wiped off the face of the planet. There was only just a few survivors from all the people in this tribe. Uh, that's a long backstory to, to get to this point, this one verse. Uh, as the story is being told, 
there's this one verse that describes how fierce the Benjamite fighters were, and it pertains to the story between um, uh, David and Goliath, uh, because Saul, King Saul, is actually, he's from the tribe of Benjamin. He's a descendant of this group. Here's the verse, chapter 20, verse 16. As it describes the civil war about to start, it says, among all these soldiers, there were 700 chosen men who were left-handed, each of whom could sling a stone at a hair and not miss. And uh, this is a description of the Benjamite fighting forces. Apparently, if you were a Benjamite from the time you were just even a little kid, you got specially trained to fight, and uh, your main weapon was a sling. And apparently, uh, they trained their boys to be left-handed sling throwers, and uh, this is a description that they could sling a stone at a hair across a field and not miss. Uh, I'm not sure about why they're all left-handed. You know, was it just genetic? Um, here's what I do know. I'm a tennis player. I hate playing people who are left-handed. It's sort of like you expect it to come one way, but then it comes the other. And uh, I suspect that if you're like a fighting force, and in that day you were, you know, you were a slinger, uh, everyone as they're like coming up on you, they're expecting you to do something with your right hand, but you come at them with your left, it makes you all the more effective. So, I mean, these were like fierce fighters. And the description here, that they could sling a stone at a hair and not miss, I mean, what training they had that any rock, I mean, across a field, they could see the hair on the head that it was going to hit, they never missed. Saul, the reason I mention this, was a Benjamite who would have got brought up with this kind of training and heritage. Next thing I want you to see about Saul, if you'll go to the next slide here, uh, 1 Samuel chapter 9, uh, which describes who Saul was. You remember the story, God's People, they didn't want God to be their king anymore. They wanted a king just like the rest of the nations. They called out for somebody that would be impressive, awesome guy. This is the description of 1 Samuel chapter 9. There was a Benjamite, a man of standing, whose name was Kish, son of Aviel. He had a son named Saul, an impressive young man, without equal among the Israelites, a head taller than any of the others. Um... A person that's a head taller than other people is what? Very, I mean, he's, he's a giant of a man. And uh, he also, I mean, the Bible makes this clear, he's not some kind of spindly weakling. I mean, he's a man's man. Handsome, rugged, impressive. And uh, you know the end of the story, right? Daniel, I mean, David is finally going to, what? <laughs> sling a stone and, and kill him. I mean, Saul was trained to do that. So here comes a giant, a champion, and, and it says right here in verse 11, Israel's champion, Saul, was dismayed and terrified. And I think that's just an important point to make. I mean, one of the things is, like, the very best that humanity had to offer in the face of this Goliath was terrified and dismayed. You know, an average people like us, you know, we don't even compare to like a Saul. He was terrified and dismayed by this Goliath. Uh, verse 11, I, I want to point this out as well. It says, Saul and all the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. And um, here's what I like to try and get at. Um, I want you to realize that as we read this story, that uh, this is not the only place in the Bible where this story is told. Uh, what do I mean? By this, the particulars of the story, yes, right here, 1 Samuel chapter 17. But the story has been told again and again and again and again. And if you've, you've been reading the Bible along with us, I mean, you have read this story I don't know how many times by now. And, and let's just take a minute now to kind of recount the story so that I mean, you'll get a sense of what this passage of Scripture is all about. Um, okay, going all the way back to Abraham. God had called Abraham out. Some of the very first words he said to Abraham. He said to Abraham, I will bless those who bless you. And God says, I will curse those who curse you. So uh, here comes Goliath. He's come to curse the descendants of Abraham. What's going to happen? I mean, God, God had said, right? Somebody curses you, they ain't just messing with you. God, they've messed with me. And God promised, like at that point, he himself would do something. So here comes this Goliath coming out to curse the Israelites. What is this story about? All right, let's just kind of follow this forward. Exodus, 
right? You remember the story of the Exodus. God's people, they ended up slaves in Egypt. They were helpless. They cried out uh, to God, and he heard them. And Exodus says that God answered with a mighty hand and outstretched arm. He performed signs and wonders and miracles like no one has ever seen. He brought those people out. And uh, maybe you remember this part of the story. At one point, as the Israelites were leaving, Pharaoh changed his mind. He sent his armies of chariots after them. God's people, the Israelites, they got pinned. They had waters of the Red Sea on one side. They had the chariots of Pharaoh's army on the other. They were helpless and hopeless. And right at that minute, God showed up in the most amazing ways. You remember the story, right? The waters parted. They walked through on dry ground. Pharaoh's armies decide to plunge in after. The waters closed down on them, and God himself saved and rescued these people and defeated Pharaoh. And um, maybe you remember this. In Exodus chapter 15, there was a song that the people started singing. You remember that song? It, it, it went like this. I will sing unto the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and rider, he's thrown into the sea. The Lord, my God, my strength, my song, he has become my salvation. The Lord is a warrior. That is his name. What were they singing? God did it. When we're helpless, when we're hopeless, when we're broken, when we're dismayed, when we're terrified, who's going to do it? Not us. It's not like we need to muster the strength or courage. Who's going to do it? God is, right? Um, you know, this, this story about being afraid of giants not the first time we've heard this before. Remember God's people, they were wandering in the desert. They were headed toward the promised land. They decided to send some spies. Remember the spies? They went to go spy out the land. They came back with a bad report. You remember that bad report? The men who had gone up with him said, we can't attack those people. They're stronger than we are. And they spread among the Israelites a bad report. The land we explored devours those living in it. All the people we saw there are of great size. What they report? There's giants in the land. We can't fight giants. We're doomed. Remember what God said? You people aren't ready. You don't understand. So they wandered around for 40 years until that generation died up. Another generation came up. And then when Joshua mobilized them to go and remember the very first battle? There's this walled fortress of Jericho. They had no weapons. They had no way to take down that city. And remember what Joshua said? He gathered the troops together. He said, look, have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Remember, God's going to fight this battle. They marched around the city, you know, beating drums, sounding trumpets, shouting out, and the walls came tumbling God down. Who did it? Was it us, people? No. So, so here's the thing. This story is the same story. I mean, the Israelites are dismayed. We can't face this giant. We can't do it. He's cursing them. Who's going to do something? Now, okay, you know how the story ends, right? There's this boy that shows up. The giant, he, when he sees it, what? What are you doing sending this boy? <laughs> you know, and, and I want you to hear David's words. Verse 45. David said to the Philistine, you have come against me with sword and spear and javelin. <clears throat> but then look what he says. But I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defiled, defied. He's, he's not saying like, I'm going to bring it, right? He's like, you know who you're in trouble with? That's what David says. And, uh, of course, you know the story, right? The giant is defeated. This is the same story, the same story. Oh, why is the Old Testament filled with this same story again and again and again and again? The very best of humanity can't accomplish it, but you know who does? Here's the reason why. Because all of the Old Testament, it's one big preparation for the story. We talked about the Goliaths in our life, our addictions, our marriages, our debt, our grades, facing the past or facing the future. You know what? All those things are, are just symptoms of a cause. Here, here's the big cause of all those symptoms. Human beings, because of sin, are separated from the creator God. That's what the Bible reveals. We have this big problem. We're separated from God. And so all the Goliaths that we face in our life, all the problems that we read about when we, 
we read about the news or watch on TV, it's all because humanity is separated from God. And the Bible makes this clear. We've separated away ourselves because of sin, guilt, and shame. There is nothing, nothing we can do to work our way back to God. It doesn't matter how hard we try. It doesn't matter how religious we become. It's not like we say to ourselves, well, I can do it. Let me double back down. No. And this is the good news of the Bible. What, what we cannot do, no matter how impressive we are, God has done for us. Here's how he did it. He sent his sub, son to be a substitute, Jesus Christ. And this is what happened on the cross. God took all our sin, all our shame, all our guilt, and he put it on Jesus and punished Jesus in our place. He, he bore our punishment and, and he won the battle. He won the, the battle of life. He lived the life we cannot live. And he won the battle of death. He died the death we cannot die. Last week we gathered together, we celebrated the resurrection. What is the resurrection about? It's about victory. This one deliverer, Jesus, won the day for the entire army of God's people. Does that make sense? All the stories of the Old Testament are all about this. Okay, um, maybe you don't know the end of the story of David and Goliath. There, there's a, an ending maybe you haven't seen yet. I want you to look with me at verse 52. In the middle of verse 51, we read these words. When the Philistines saw that their hero was dead, they turned and ran. Verse 52. Then the men of Israel and Judah surged forward with a shout and pursued the Philistines to the entrance of Gath and to the gates of Ekron, which are two Philistine cities. They surged forward with a shout. You see, when the enemy had been defeated by God, God's people were emboldened to surge forward themselves. And uh, all right, here's what I want you to walk away with today. If, as you face your Goliaths, Goliaths, you think that you need to fight for the victory, then you're going to be disappointed all throughout life. If you believe that you need to put your effort and fight for the victory, uh, you're in an impossible situation. Here's the thing I want you to know. We don't fight for the victory. We fight from the victory. Does that make sense? The victory has already been won. Jesus already conquered the main thing, that we were totally separated from God. He's brought us back to him. If we put our faith and trust in him, he's brought us back to God. We don't fight for the victory. We fight from the victory. Our lives are totally different when we realize that we're just surging forward with a great shout because of what Jesus has already accomplished for us. Amen.